I want to speak just for a few brief moments in your hearing. The Valley of Acre. The Valley of Acre. We live in the last days. Days where the prophet prophesied, the apostle prophesied, that men would love pleasures more than love God. And now we live in a day where the name of the game is get as much pleasure with as little consequence as you possibly can. Matter of fact, I believe it was Lester Crawley in the 1800s who coined the term, do what thou wilt. Anton LaVey, some 50 years ago or so, coined the term for the satanic church. The whole of the law is do what thou wilt. And today, both professing satanic worshipers and non-professing satanic worshipers live by this code. Do what thou wilt. And in case you wanted to know, Jay-Z doesn't mind wearing a hood that says, do what thou wilt. The name of the game is do whatever feels right in the moment. Follow your hearts. Trust your instincts. Follow the wind of your emotions. And the only thing wrong is people that try to tell you that it is wrong. We live in a world of cause and effect. That is more than just a scientific term for physics. That is a, term, a, a, a law that God has set up for all of life. For every action, there is a reaction. For every cause, there is an effect. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Sad to say, but in this day, men want to get rid of the notion that there is punishment for sin. They are foolish to believe that the only judgment for sin is people that believe that there is judgment for sin. We stand between them and doing all the abominable things that come to their mind. Because we preach the truth in love, but we preach it with power. They are deceived into believing that we are the problem. They're deceived into believing that the only thing wrong with the world is people that disagree with what they want to do. As a result, they come up with two ways to try to ease their conscience because you can take away all men that don't like their actions. If God be God, their conscience will still bother them. And sad to say, the Lord has a whole bunch of churches that make it their goal to ease the consciences and Bishop, I discovered by the word of God that you can't have an easygoing conscience and have the Holy Ghost at the same time. I, I remember in the word in 1 Samuel chapter 5 when the Bible says that the Philistines stole the ark and they placed it in the temple of Dagon and they wanted God and they wanted Dagon. Isn't that just like the modern church? They want God to bless. They want God's anointing. But they want their homosexuality. They want their fornication. 
They want their wife and the girlfriend. Somebody say amen. amen. But after one night, Dagon was on his face. I don't care what anybody says. You can't be a Holy Ghost filled believer and keep idols in your life alone. They may try to creep up on you, may try to creep up in you. But all it takes is one night and that idol will be face down. They try to do like many believers do and set Dagon back up. But after one more night, not only will he knock him down, but he'll cut off his hands and his head. In order for them to keep Dagon in their life, they had to expel Jehovah. They got rid of the ark. And God has many Christians that have expelled Jesus Christ because they want to keep their idols. God is a gentleman. He's not going to force anybody to do anything they do not want to do. He'll plead with you. He'll preach to you. He'll make you feel the sting and the effect. But once he gets the picture that you rather have that idol, he'll just chuck the deuces. They sent the art down to Gath. And in Gath, the Bible says God smote them in the secret parts. Now you can be in a powerful church like Upper Room Church of God in Christ in a powerful jurisdiction like NC Third. But if you have idols in your life, you may be around the ark, but you have hidden issues that is eating away at your being. You, 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 you know, you ain't got no peace. You come here and you shout, and then you curse them out on the parking lot. You come in and shout and you get upset because someone cuts you off. You come in and do your holy dance. Then you get home and do your unsanctified dance. You have a good facade, but on the inside, you're dying. You're hurting. You're bound. God does not mix with unholiness. Either he will clean it or he will leave it. But we live in a day when people don't want their conscience disturbed. So it's two things that they have been striving to do. The first one is they're trying to dispel God from existence. They believe that if they can cause a generation to believe that there is no creator. Because if you have a creator, then you have a creation. And when you have a creation, the one who created has an intelligent design. And anything that is designed has a purpose for its design. Nobody designs anything without a purpose first. The chair was designed because somebody wanted to sit down. Somebody say amen. amen. The microphone was designed so people can portray or, or project their voice. It was the cause, the purpose is what inspired the design. But if they agree to the notion that there is a creator, then they admit that there is a creation. To admit that there is a creation, they have to admit that there is a design. And if they admit that there is a design, then they have to admit that there is a purpose. And wherever there is purpose, there is accountability for that purpose. 
which means that we're not here by happenstance. Do it thou wilt does not portray or does not go for people of God. Because we're not here for ourselves. No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. We all owe our lives and existence and purpose to the God of the Bible. Hallelujah. Uh, so they want to get us bamboozled with things like evolution, the Big Bang Theory, as if nothing can create something. But the idea is as long as people are not sure that there is a creator, then they won't be worried about, bless God, the consequences for the actions. But the plan is backfiring. Do you know that since 2007, suicide amongst the ages of 15 and 19 in girls have doubled? Since 2007, we all know what happened in 2008. And uh, it has doubled. And since then, 30% more boys commit suicide. In a society that pushes, do what you want. In a society that says, be who you are. A society that says, be inclusive under their doctrine. A society that preaches a false love and false acceptance. You think that suicide rates would be lower. But anytime you forget the God of the Bible, anytime you forget the God who created the heavens and the earth, you are on your way to death and to a devil's hell. Uh, you can say what you want to about the Christian faith. You can say it's a crutch. You can say it's the white man's God. You can say it's for weak people. You can say it's for losers. But when people are saved, they don't commit suicide. When people are saved, they have hope for tomorrow. When people are saved, they have joy in the midst of sorrow. My faith keeps me going. My faith stands me up straight and strong. And I can look in the devil's face and say no more. My life is worth living because Jesus lives. Yes, sir. Uh, I want God in my conscience. Uh, because God is there, I can live the face tomorrow. Because he lives, my God, I have a reason to be here. My life is not happenstance and I am significant. Yes, sir. Uh, they are fighting against the idea of a God uh, who uh, is in existence. But if that does not work, they'd rather change who God is. Now, I made an important discovery in the Bible where it says, I am the Lord God, I change not. Revelation tells us Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hallelujah. And I've realized something. The reason why God don't change is because God is eternal. Uh, God is omnipresent, which means he stood at the end when he wrote the beginning. Uh, he's here, there, and everywhere at the same time. He's back there, he's right here, and he is up there. And if he's already in the future, there's no time for him to change. I want you to know that God saw the homosexual movement when he struck in the Old Testament that it is an abomination. God saw Barack Obama spearheading the homosexual movement when he inspired Paul to write Romans chapter 1. Before the, the epidemic of AIDS, God was already right there beholding the things that are done in the dark. And he struck it in Romans chapter 1, where he says they receive unto themselves the just recompense of reward. So A's break out all over the place. Yes, God was the same then, and he's the same now. And if God is the same, 
consequences are still the same. Punishment is still the same. Judgments is still the same. If it was wrong then, it's wrong now. I don't care if everybody accepts it. Let all men be liars. Hallelujah. You may, get, you may be able to ease your conscience. You may be able to get people to like what you do. But what you going to do when God get involved? There is no shadow of turning in God. He does not change. He's the same. And I'm glad about that tonight because that means his mercy endureth. You know, when God had mercy on you, he already knew the mistakes you were going to make. When he called you to be born again, he already knew of your shortcomings that you're going to make. But thank God, both now and forever, his mercy still works. And when I got up this morning, last time I checked, his mercy is still renewed. His righteousness endured for all generations. Thank God that my God don't change. That means a thousand years from now, we were singing his praises. He's not going to stop the processional. And says, you know what, Gabriel, I've been thinking. I don't know why we let Elder Isaac Quick into this church, into heaven. I've been thinking, and I tell you, in the year 2012, he was really jacked up. In the year 2016, he had his issues. I, I, I think we need to reconsider and, 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 and open up one more slot in hell. But I thank God that if God has established you in heaven, once you get there, his righteousness endureth for all generations. Yes, they want to change God. They want to change who he is. But I don't care who thinks. Uh, take every Bible if you want to and take out every scripture that speaks against homosexuality. His word is still established in heaven. And it's still going to be the same. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost telling me to go ahead to the ending point. Well, we must understand first what the Valley of Acre is. In the book of Joshua, we understand that they had just crossed over the River Jordan. Moses has died. Joshua is now in command. God gives him instruction as to how they are going to conquer Jericho. And he tells them, God tells Joshua to gather the people and to march around the walls for seven days. And on the seventh day to march seven times. Uh, but when Joshua gave the instruction, he added in one more detail that God did not instruct him. He told them that as you march, don't say nothing. And the reason why he didn't want them to say anything, because about 40 years ago, when he and 11 more spies went out to spy the land, uh, 10 of them had a negative report. And their mouth got them in trouble. Joshua didn't want to relive what happened then. And so he gave out the commandment for everybody to remain silent. I don't care if you don't understand the plan. I don't care if it makes no sense to you. I don't care if you don't believe that God is able. Uh, but my God, I, uh, if we be quiet, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. And I believe we can talk ourselves out of our own victory. We can talk ourselves out of our own blessing. And saints of God, be careful for those peers that speak against the man of God. And speak against the vision of God. They will cause you to forfeit the victory that God wants to give you. 
Uh, but the Bible says that God commanded them that when they get behind the walls, that there was some treasure back there. There were some good looking things back there. But God specifically instructed them uh, to leave the accursed thing alone. And a man named Achan, while he is ravaging through the city of Jericho, he sees some treasure and the devil talks to him and tells him, uh, bless God, that won't nobody see if you take a little bit of that for yourself. Isn't that what the devil tells us today? Honey, won't nobody see? But all that we are, it lays naked before the God of the Bible. And he took that which was a curse and buried it in his tent. And after the great victory of Jericho, they now head to the small town of Ai. Ai, for which they ought to have been able to defeat with relative ease. But the Bible says they were utterly defeated. It was a great embarrassment for the children of God. Say what you want to. Sin is an embarrassment. Sin is ugly. Sin will bite you every time. And God tells Joshua, why are you crying to me? For there is sin in the camp. For someone has touched the accursed thing. And the Bible says that Joshua gathered together all the tribes and he narrowed it down to the tribe of Judah. Then he narrowed it down to the family of Zerah. And then he narrowed it down to the family of Zabdi. Then he narrowed it down to the family of Carmi. And then he narrowed it down to Achan. And Joshua says, Achan, give God the glory and confess this sin you have committed. And Achan said, is of the truth I saw that stuff. And I wanted it, so I took it and I buried it within my tent. The Bible then declares that they went to the tent and they dug up all that he had buried and they took all of it. Then they took Achan and his wife and his children and his cattle and everything he owned and took it to a place called the Valley of Acre. And there they wound back and they stoned him. And there they killed him. And there they set everything up on fire. I don't know about you, but that seems pretty harsh. The man, when he was found out, God ordered his execution. There in the Valley of Acre, they named it Acre to represent trouble. It's the Valley of Trouble. Achan was a man of trouble. It was a place that represented God's judgment. A place that represents God's displeasure. You know that troubled me for a little while until I flipped over to Hosea chapter 2 where the Bible says that the valley of Acre will be a door of hope. Now that doesn't sound like logic to me. You mean a place where a man was executed for his selfish sin where his family paid the price is a place that is a door of hope for us. I want you to know that for people of God, judgment is not a scary thing, but it's a thing of mercy. For it's down there in the Valley of Acre that God came down, tired, blessed God, of all the sins his people were committed. But more than anything, he was tired of having to treat them according to the sins that they committed. Uh, in burnt offerings and sacrifices, he had no pleasure. And he had no pleasure 
for with the death of the wicked. Uh, so he said, when it comes down to the valley of Acre, while we were down there one day, drowning in the cesspool of our own sin, uh, the, the, the critics, the devil, and our own conscience, with stones in their hand, getting ready to stone us right where we are. I see Jesus stepping in right on time, saying mercy suits his case. Aiken may have died, but I feel mercy right now in the valley of Acre, in the valley of trouble, in the valley of sin. Jesus stepped out of eternity into time and bless God he stepped into the valley uh, right there with us and the Bible says he took the stones for us he said if you're going to hit anybody you might as well hit me for he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquity the chastisement of our peace was on him and with his stripes we are healed you know it reminds me of the woman called in adultery they brought her to the feet of jesus and said this woman was called in adultery what shall we do the bible says god got down and he wrote in the dirt we don't know what he wrote we speculate many things but when he got up from the dirt he said he who had no sin or he that had not, that does not have this sin cast the first stone uh, but what I love about that scripture uh, is that they all put their stones down uh, and walked away Jesus then asked the question uh, where are thine accusers uh, and he says they are gone uh, and he says neither do I accuse you uh, go and sin no more uh, I'm so glad today uh, that when my accusers were all around uh, Satan was all around uh, my sin was ever before me uh, Satan had me uh, bound in his chains uh, but God said uh, where are thy accusers where is that sin where is that conscience have I not cleansed it have I not sanctified you have I not washed you therefore I'm glad today to know Jesus for myself you can have Muhammad but he didn't get in the valley with me you can have Krishna he didn't get in the valley with me you can have Buddha he didn't get in the valley with me but oh when I needed it the most Jesus stepped on in right all time I'm glad Jesus he saves he delivers he sets free sing it hallelujah my 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 God hallelujah glory 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 to God you know I'm glad today you know I heard the late and great Bishop G. Patterson same one day look who how far Jesus came down uh, if he had to stop at the sun it would have been a brighter world if he had to stop at the moon it would have been a saner world if he had to stop at Jupiter it would have been a mightier world if he had to stop at Mercury it would have been a faster moving world by Saturn and the other planets he was not seen and Mars had no man for which he could redeem but I'm so glad that I can say to take my feet out of the miry clay he came all the way down past the celestial sky past the mountains past the level plain down into the valley I'm glad Glad he came down to the cesspool. He became poor that I might become rich. He died that I might live again. He became sin that I might do the righteousness of God. I'm glad today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know why you did it. Aiken didn't get it, but I'm so glad 
you gave it to me. I'm so glad you have mercy on me. I'm so glad you saved me. If God saved your soul, you ought to run and tell three people, he did it for me, he did it. He did it, he did it. I think we ought to praise him because he did it. We ought to stomp on the devil's head because he did it. We didn't deserve it. He did it. He did it for me. He did it for you. He did it. I'm glad. I gotta dance. I gotta run. I gotta shout. I'm glad. <laughs> 